So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, July the 9th, and this is episode number 116 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. Thank you to those of you who submitted your questions. And it's hazy outside, super foggy, temperatures are 63 degrees Fahrenheit or 17 Celsius. Let's see, this is also available as a Podbean podcast, The Way to Be, and this is the way to be. So thanks for being here. We have a lot to cover today. I did not do a Q&A last Friday because we did that walkthrough on the horizontal long Langstroth beehive and we put a bunch of empty frames in there. We expanded them a little bit and there's going to be a follow-up coming this week and it's going to be in the high 80s coming right up. So what else? Also I wanted to remind you a lot of people are asking about how they can see all of these. This is a playlist. So I'm going to put a link down in the video description here that will connect you to the playlist of all 116 of these episodes. And there's other handy information there for you too. Also, if you have a question, please write it in the comment section below. Let's jump right in. So the first one comes from Be Kind to Be Free. Freddie has some sort of starter strip on the foundationless frames when you place them in the hive. So you need to checkerboard them with foundation frames to keep them from making wonky comb. And should I wire the frames? I'm interested in reducing plastic foundation frames in brood nests and probably miss the primary wax building season, but would like to have a plan to add foundationless frames to expand brood nests in my larger hives in the future. Thanks. Well, do I put foundation in them? First of all, this is what a foundationless frame looks like. We also use acorn and plastic foundation. We use better comb and Sometimes we use the acorn foundation by itself, so it comes as a foundation insert and also as a complete one-piece plastic frame. So the advantage to a plastic frame is that pests don't generally chew through it, like wax worms, wax moth larvae. But the question is about whether or not I do something, do I put a starter strip in here, because this is the back of it, this is the top. This is already grooved out, and that's so that it can receive the plastic inserts that go in here, but no. I don't do anything to it. I know that you can rub pieces of beeswax on there as a primer. All I do is put this, he references checkerboarding, I put a frame with foundation in it or drawn comb. I put a foundationless frame, then I put another frame that has a foundation or drawn comb, and I juxtapose them like that. And what the bees do is, because it's the miracle of bee space, so they naturally go to the center space between those other two frames, assuming they're all pushed together snug. I do not, for example, put nine frames in a 10 frame box because I don't necessarily want them to draw out longer, deeper cells in the honeycomb. So I push them all shoulder to shoulder, and these are the shoulders right here that allow for bee space. Push them all right snug together. If there's excess space, I leave it on either end adjacent to the interior surface of the brood box. So foundationless, but the other thing is only put foundationless frames in places where you're not going to run your bee frames through an extractor later. So it's not great for a honey super, for example. So if you're doing foundationless in a, in a honey super, you want to have the wire reinforcement just uh, for starters there, just to make sure you're going to be good to go and that they're not going to fall apart on you. So also you have to be careful when you're inspecting foundationless frames because uh, they can be very, very flexible on a really hot day when you're doing your inspection and you can tilt your frame and the comb can swing out and fall right off of that interior surface. Someone was concerned about that when we were doing the long Langstroth inspection. I tried to tilt them and show you that the bottom moves a little bit and to be very careful with new honeycomb that does not have a foundation supporting it. Next question, number two, comes from Robin, Columbus, Ohio. Start my first hive. It's a flow hive this year. I've built my bee yard with space for up to four hives. My question is that considering how hives grow or split and sometimes swarm, how do you control the number of hives so it does not get beyond your resources to care for them? Let them swarm, split, sell. Thanks. This is uh, comes into play when you have beekeeping friends. You want to make some beekeeping friends because if you want to limit the number of hives, this is a restriction that I don't personally have to deal with, so 
you know, I don't think a lot about it, but there are so many people, this question comes up so often, they just want two hives and nothing more. You can allow them to swarm, but again, I don't recommend letting your bees swarm when you live in an urban area where it could cause problems with your neighbors and people want to keep bees around there. They want to be in harmony with those who are not necessarily beekeeping enthusiasts and you don't want to just let your bees swarm. So you need to make friends with people who also keep bees who may be able to take your surplus. If you absolutely want to control your bee um, population, for example, and you want to make sure that they don't swarm out, you can remove their queen. When you remove the queen, you have to make sure first that they have the resources inside the hive to replace her. So that means they have to have eggs. So when you remove the queen and maybe give that queen away to somebody who needs one, beekeepers association, somebody needed a queen. You want to keep your numbers down. You want to keep your colonies within the confines of a few boxes on your property. Then give away the queens and cause them to replace the queen. It's a risk. You could end up queenless. I've never had a colony go queenless that way because you want to only do that when there are plenty of drones in the area and you can see that by what's going on in your own colonies. But that causes a brood break, so that's natural varroa control. You're about 30 days out to getting a new queen that has um, laid eggs, had those eggs reach maturity and start to replenish your stock. So for that whole 30 days, when you allow them to requeen themselves, your bee numbers in the colony are in decline. Therefore, you're reducing the space that's necessary inside the hive and you're doing varroa control and you get a new queen going into winter. So consider maybe giving away one of your senior queens and keeping them under control. You're going to have to inspect to know what's going on there, but uh, making splits, if you're trying to keep your numbers down, you have to do something with the split that you just created. There again, unless you're giving that away to someone else. You can also give away resources from a hive. So let's say you like your queen, everything looks good. You have lots of stuff in there and uh, they've got the resources in honey. They've got lots of pollen stored. They've got a bunch of brood. If she's producing piles of brood, maybe somebody that you know, again, the fellowship of beekeepers, someone you know may have a hive that's in decline that needs a good boost. And so you could give away a frame of brood. Now, the thing is you got to give them away with a bunch of nurse bees because even in transit, they have to keep that brood warm, protected. And uh, those are just some ideas to get the wheels turning. But uh, make friends that are beekeepers and they can take on your surplus stock. I don't recommend swarming as a control measure if you live in an urban area. If you live where I live, how do you know if your area, if the wild of your area can support feral colonies of bees? Beescape.org. So if you go to beescape.org, look up your area and see what kind of environmental opportunities there are for your bees to move in and if it's suitable habitat for feral colonies. So those are all things to think about. Question number three here is from Diana from Rixieville, Virginia. How do I fight Japanese beetles and keep my bees safe? I have four hives. The beetles have eaten so many of my crops and flowers so much I can't even harvest. My bees search around for pollen and beetles are in the way. I found one dead in my hive. What can I do to kill these beetles and keep my bees safe? So if I keep the bees safe, maybe we're also saying we don't want to use any kind of insecticide, right? Well, it just so happens, Japanese beetles, if you don't know, they munch on everything. They are very destructive to plants. They eat the foliage. They chew on your berries and fruits and things like that. They also chew on flowers that have nectar in them. So they are a pest. Well, I'm gonna to talk to you about Japanese beetles because it just happens to be something that I've done a lot of research and practical testing on. So I can tell you the number one trap company for Japanese beetles would be the Tangle, Fit, Tangle Foot Company. So, what really matters from Tanglefoot right now is the bait. You can actually make your own traps, but I'm gonna show you something that gets used by research facilities all over the country. This is an example of a Japanese beetle trap. See the plastic veins? This one is really heavy duty. When you're looking at these online, you can't tell how well it's made. Tanglefoot used to make these very thin yellow ones with the accordion extension plastic bases which I no longer use, even though I endorse those through the years. 
Here's what I do indoors from Tanglefoot is the bait that they use. This is a dual pheromone bait. This is a floral lure at the top and this is a sex pheromone at the bottom. So it attracts the Japanese beetles. They fly in a very clumsy way and they just bump into this and they fall. Oh look, I have Japanese beetles inside this uh, jar that I just caught this morning. It probably doesn't show very well, but there's four of them in there because I went out because I thought it would be cool to see if I could find some. But what I want to show you about this, it says uh, Tracy on the top, T-R-E-C-E Incorporated. So this is the company that makes them. And what's interesting is this is just a plastic mayonnaise jar that's empty. I got my Japanese beetles in here. They're still crawling around. Anyway, this has a threaded section in the middle that matches these jars. So don't buy the plastic jars or the plastic bags, which are even worse. If you've got a dog or something running around and they smell the beetles in that bag, they'll chew the plastic bag open sometimes. Plus they want like $6 for three plastic bags. Recycle your plastic. I did not just release all my beetles. They're still in there. Anyway, <laughs> you could use peanut butter jars and stuff because that's a standard threaded top. But here's the other thing. What if you got a bunch of them? Then you go a step up. So here's another one. I'll try to find a link to that company, but you can look up T-R-E-C-E Incorporated Beetle Trap. Because all I do is I buy these top pieces and I put them on different jars. But look at this. This is a standard M&M peanut jar that you see in the stores. I mean, it's health food because there's peanuts in there. This is not threaded on, it's just snug fitting. So even though these have threads, look at the outer rim of this. All it is is smooth, but it has a slight camphor to it. So you can push it on and there it stays. It does not fall off of there. And then you hang these along the edges of your wood line downwind from any plants that you're hoping to protect. Because if you put it upwind of plants you're hoping to protect, what happens is the pheromone goes across the plants that you're going to protect. The little beetles put their little antenna up and they follow it and they land on the plants before they get to this. So this is downwind. The other thing is a lot of people say that, ah, if you put out those Japanese beetle traps, then uh, you're gonna be drawing beetles from all over the place and now you're gonna have more beetles than you ever would have had otherwise, so don't put them up. Oh yeah, well, through the years, and I've been using these for decades, uh, specifically the Tanglefoot traps, Tanglefoot uh, bait, and we've reduced the numbers easily 90% of the beetles, because every year, no matter where they're coming from, we're taking them out. So now let's say you have a real huge beetle problem and maybe the M&M thing isn't enough. Oh look. You might want to go with peanut butter pretzel containers, one of those big ones. See that? Now we have a really tall one. The other thing is, this is a funnel, right? So it's raining, and when it rains, what's going to go in? The rainwater is going to go in here, and it's going to drown the beetles, and it's going to stink, and it's going to add a lot of weight to this. So always drill little holes in the bottom of it. I drilled holes in the bottom of this one. They're plastic, easy to drill. And of course, I drilled holes in the bottom of this one. And the bait that you want to get, you can make your own traps. So you can make facsimiles of this if you want to. All it needs is a funnel. Something for the beetles to bump into and fall down into that funnel. And you've got your Japanese beetles. I recycle them. So the other thing is, how do you kill them once you got them in this jar? So I've got these beetles climbing around. See, there's a beetle. It's alive. Crawling right there. So you've got these beetles crawling around. What do you do with them? How do you kill them? All you do is run them into a bowl of hot water. Nothing else, no soap, nothing. You don't need anything. It's just the hot water right out of the tap. That'll kill them. And then I do two things. Either I feed them to my chickens. I know everybody doesn't have chickens. So you can also feed them to your fish or you've got a pond nearby where maybe kids go fishing. So you take them in the hot water and you just throw them out there on the water and the fish eat them. A lot of different fish varieties will eat the Japanese beetles. So the best lure ever anywhere is the Tanglefoot lure. And then the trap design, I just leave that up to you to find one that works. 
and try to find one that's got a threaded base so that you can use your own jars in it and you don't have to buy and throw away plastic bags everywhere. So that's my story for that. I was ready for that one. You can look at my Japanese beetle videos. They've been out forever. Frederick Dunn, Japanese beetles. Anyway, here's the next one. Suzanne from Quebec, Canada. The following situation popped up twice in the past week on Facebook. How to tell the difference between a young queen laying of multiple eggs in cells and that of a laying worker. This is a situation where I can't find the queen. Also, what happens to the multiple eggs in the cell? Obviously, there's only one that will develop, but what happens to the other eggs? Are they cleaned out by nurse bees after not having been fed by them? And so on. Okay, so here's the thing. The term of the day for this is called policing. So there are nurse bees that tool around and they inspect the cells. And we're going to talk about, too, some ways that you can tell the difference between a laying queen that's got multiple eggs in the cell or laying workers that also lay multiple eggs in the cell. But when there's more than one egg in the cell or any cell where the workers don't want them in there, they clean them out. They actually eat them. Yeah, it's true. So they ingest the extra eggs. Now, the other thing is when you're looking at a brood frame, and when a queen is in lay and she's laying worker eggs, she does a very good job of developing a consistent pattern. So from the center out, she'll build a cluster and they'll keep the eggs all together. And so you'll see the developmental stages of the pupae that just looks like a rainbow of age. In other words, the youngest in the middle with each subsequent one going out and so on. So then... When you have a laying worker, they're more sporadic. And in fact, you can have more than one laying worker in a hive at the same time. But they tend to have a shotgun little clusters of developing larvae, and they're always going to be uh, drones when it comes to laying workers. But there are some queens that don't get mated well, and they are capable of producing drones also. They call that a queen that shoots blanks. Infertile... Um, eggs are drones. So laying workers can do that, queens can do that. So how would we know if a queen is laying those eggs or if it's a laying worker since they're both drones? Well, one is the consistency. The other thing is, you know about the laying workers, they can't always get their abdomens all the way down to cell to park that egg in the bottom the way the queen does. So most often when you see eggs from laying workers, they're near the bottom, but they'll be stuck right on the sides and you won't often sometimes see just two eggs. You'll see three or four. Sometimes there's multiple laying workers. And they do. They clean them up and they leave one so that it can develop. And that is, of course, the nurse bees that are cleaning that up. And uh, often laying workers will lay in a cell that's sized for a worker. So it's not sized for drones. So what happens, it ends up being what's called a bullet cell. So if this is a cross-section of the cell, there's a convexity a really prominent convexity to the capping that goes over that pupa. The other thing is, since it's a smaller diameter cell and it's not a drone cell, which are much larger in diameter, and therefore also the drone is larger when it's laid by a queen and everything else is healthy and this isn't some kind of emergency uh, recovery, which is what a lot of the laying workers are doing. It's an emergency. They're just trying to get their genetics out there while the colony collapses on itself and through attrition just ends up not existing ultimately. So, but even those drones are a little smaller. So even when you're looking at drones on the frames, you'll notice that some of the layer drones compared to a nice fat drone laid by a queen who deliberately did that in a drone cell, they are physically different in size, health, speed. And the good news of that is that those are undernourished drones. They're undersized and they don't outfly the stronger, more robust stock that comes from the queen. So actually, I think it's a great way to uh, make sure that that doesn't get into the breeding stock either. So that's it. The, the pattern, the consistency of the pattern, if it's queen laying, they tend to be much more prolific and consistent in filling every available cell going out where the workers, you know, cluster here, cluster there. The other thing is the depth into the cell that the egg is being laid. The queen will put her egg right in the middle, right on the bottom, 
workers lay their eggs to the sides often don't make it all the way to the bottom of the cell. So those are all very good tells, even if they're all drone eggs. Question number five. Cindy from Flushing, Ohio. We put the bee escape under a full super. When we came back this morning, the box was robbed clean. The top cover notch was down, but we thought it was covered by the top cover. Must not have been. The question is about all the dead bees on the inside and all around the outside of the hive. Would that be bees that were trying to protect the hive? There were hundreds, it looks like. There are still lots of bees and brood in the nest and resources. When we first got to the hive the day we put on the bee escape, there were lots of bees flying that seemed erratic and disturbed. Could they have been robbers already there? Okay, so there's lots of lessons learned here in this. When there's an inner cover and you're putting that, uh, a bee escape is a wooden board, or there's a plastic version, I guess, too. But when you have your super on top, and then there's a queen excluder underneath. Often you're going to pull the queen excluder, you're going to put the bee escape down there, and we're trying to get the bees out of the honey super so that you can harvest the honey. So based on this description, what happened was there's an inner cover above that. If you notice this inner cover, there's no notch above or below. Some of them come from the manufacturer with those notches in them. They're for venting, and some of them are used, they're big enough to be an upper entrance. So if that's a quarter inch tall, that little notch up there, it gets used by the bees as an upper entrance. So what's being described here in this question is there's a honey super underneath of this, a bee escape got put under that, so the workers are moving out. But guess what? There was still an opening up here. So bees began to rob it. And I do suspect that you are right that there was a battle royal going on because the bees were still trying to defend their colony. A lot of those dead bees around the outside of the colony were likely the ones that were trying to get in. Once they get into the honey super and uh, they get back to their hive with the honey that they collected, there's nothing more appealing to foraging bees than honey that's already ready to consume where no extra work needs to be done to it. So, and it cleaned out the whole super. So the lesson learned is always, uh, if you're going to use an escape board, Make sure that that honey super, or if you're using a fume board or anything else to drive the bees out of that box, that no other bees can get into it once they're out. Because once the robbing starts, you lost that. You lost a big bunch of the population of the bees because they fought it out. And uh, that's it. So the good news is it looks like there's plenty left over. They're going to replenish that and they're going to take care of it. But... Uh, they have linden trees and clover in full bloom. Linden trees, little leaf lindens, basswood family, very good trees for nectar. Here's the next one. Question number six already. Garrett Bruce was going through my homeowners association bylaws and they state no animals, livestock, or poultry of any kind shall be raised, bred, or kept on any part of the said property except dogs, cats, or other household pets, provided that such household pets are not kept, bred, or maintained for any commercial purpose, shall not be allowed in the common area. This is a rule that was written back in 1984. I plan on keeping my two hives in the back corner of my backyard surrounded by above-ground garden boxes with trellises to totaling to six feet tall, flowering vines will climb the trellis, blocking the view of the small bee yard. I have ran this idea by my adjacent neighbors, and they have all told me that this was okay with them. My question is this. If it were you, would you proceed with keeping bees and hope the Homeowners Association doesn't find out somehow? Or would you petition an exception to the bylaw from 1984 before incorporating the two hives to the backyard? I'm leaning toward the old saying, that it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. The absolute worst case scenario, I could find someone who in my bee club that has property nearby that wouldn't mind keeping the bees. Okay, this question is a setup. Because I used to do this to guys in the military too. If you're going to ask me for my answer to that question, you're going to have to follow the bylaws. Now, what I would do, I always say, if you're asking me, you have to follow the bylaws. 
But it's, in all seriousness, though, there are a lot of uh, communities that uh, beekeeping is not allowed. What is going on with the bees anyway? Now listen to this. It says, no animals, livestock, or poultry. What are honeybees? This is a hard thing for people to wrap their heads around. Honeybees are livestock. Honeybees and beekeeping falls under the Department of Agriculture. They are not native animals. They're animals, they're insects, and they are livestock that we keep and manage. That's why when we say that the bees are out in a tree somewhere, that's not a wild colony of bees, that's a feral colony. Bees, just like there would be feral cats if they took off and set up their little gang in the woods somewhere. So they were once kept, they were once managed, and that's why these fall under livestock, and therefore the regulations, when they say these blanket things, they cover that in order to um, appease people. It's a homeowner's association, so it's not a civic ordinance, it's a homeowner's association. So here's what I highly recommend. First of all, get prepared to discuss in a very non-defensive, super friendly way what the benefits of having those bees in your yard would be. And the other thing is you can get ahead of it by being the one who establishes those rules and regulations. Where would you get an idea for how to do that? Well, you look at other homeowners associations, you look at other communities that are considered bee friendly, and you look at how they're written. You look and see what restrictions there are, if any, and how many colonies, just like the chicken friendly cities out there, like Cleveland, Ohio, chicken friendly city. They set up regulations about how many chickens can be kept. Can you have a rooster? Same thing with honeybees. How many honeybees can you keep? How big must the lot be to have those honeybees on there? So you need to do your homework, touch base with people who got lenience, you know, if they got leniency for something like this, how did they word it? How did it go? What was the opposition? What was the strongest obstacle you ran into? There's always going to be someone in the neighborhood who's allergic and who swears that if they get stung by a bee, you're going to be sued. And you might think, that that can happen, that that's just silly, because bees fly miles in every direction. How do you know that was my bee? Well, I come originally from Missouri, the Show Me State, specifically Kirkwood, Missouri, the first suburb west of the Mississippi established in the United States. So it kind of has some notoriety there. But guess what? There's a beekeeper in my hometown, Kirkwood, Missouri. And uh, someone was stung a couple blocks away from the beekeeper, and they sued the beekeeper successfully. So you don't want to be renegade. You don't want to run outside of the regulations once you know about them. Even though your immediate neighbors say, okay, people can be, and this will shock you, they can be completely irrational when it comes to insects, especially venomous insects, and if they potentially will suffer anaphylactic shock from being stung, you want to make sure that all your ducks in a row and that your homeowners insurance policy covers you. I found out my insurance policy covers me. So those are all good questions to ask. I am never going to tell someone to not obey ordinances and bylaws and things like that, but I will help you um, get the information together by doing that research and finding out uh, places where they did have regulations against keeping bees and then how they got that turned and how they got that corrected. And you want to be present when those decisions are being made because it's much better for you to come in and suggest a way that they can be responsibly managed. And then we talk about all these people that have flower gardens and they've got the vegetable gardens and they've got all these things that are gonna benefit from the pollinators that you're gonna bring around. And that's why they get these gardening uh, groups in some cities where they even in the garden center in the city, they have apiaries at the end of it and an apiary club and association and things like that. So there are lots of examples out there of people that have turned that into a success story. Question number seven comes from Lizzie. I have a question for a flow hive in winter. When you have a super of honey for the bees to eat, do you leave it above or below the brood box? I've heard both ways suggested, but I don't want to end up with brood in the super before I can put the queen excluder back on in spring. So first of all, I did a whole video on wintering with flow hives. So I will put a link to that video 
down in the video description of this because I'm going to show you my configurations and what the thought process is and how you make sure that your bees have what they need, need to get through a really strong winter. And uh, But always the supers, just super. Super means extra, but it also means above. So when you're doing a honey super, a honey box, it should always go above the brood. And that's because where's your entrance? Down at the bottom. So if you under super, some people say that all the time, and I think it's being misunderstood. Because people talk about over supering, under supering, they're both supers. So in other words, it's not putting a super under the brood box. That's a whole different category where some people have a two brood box system going into winter. And because the bees rise through winter, they go into the second brood box. And then in spring, they rotate brood boxes. So they take the upper brood box currently occupied by the bees going into spring and the bottom brood box is generally empty. So they swap them. So that's brood swapping. That's not under supering. So then under supering are the honey supers up above. So if you've got a, let's say we've got a brood box right here and then we've got a honey super that's full and we want to add another honey super. You have an option to add that on top or to lift the full honey super and put another honey super directly below that, which is above your brood box. And that's because it relieves congestion over the brood area and makes them think they have a lot of extra space and therefore they fill that with honey resources. So there's under supering and there's brood box rotations. Those are separate things. So what I do, is would you leave the honey super on for the bees to eat? So here's the thing, if it's a brood box, I always keep the honey supers above that. I always establish at least one deep of brood and one medium super of honey just for the bees before we go into winter. And then above that, because they need over 47 pounds of honey to get them through winter, the more insulation you have, the less honey they consume. If you don't have upper entrances and upper venting in the winter time also, the less honey they're going to consume because they're using less energy to keep the cluster warm in winter. But I would never put honey under the brood box. And that's because your entrance is at the bottom. So I hope that helped with that. Question number eight, Leah. I have to ask, is the goal peak honey collection or is it the thrill of the chess game or a mix of both? So I'm guessing the question is for me. You know, in other words, why do I keep bees? Is it to get a whole bunch of honey? No, and this question actually came up on some oral exams I was taking. And uh, the whole thing is about, you know, like the flow hive, the cost of it. Is it worth it? Well, yeah, it's worth it to me because I'm not in the honey business. Because uh, if I'm going to draw honey off and I can get it straight from a hive, straight from a frame, straight to a jar, and then straight to my kitchen counter in kind of a very easy move with all the honey staying in the apiary and everything else, then I do that. But what I'm really interested in is how the bees use the equipment that they're provided with, how they benefit from it or don't benefit from it, how they come out of winter stronger, and what the behaviors are in the hive, on the landing board, in the air, and when foraging. So for me, I'm keeping the bees to learn about the bees. So I'm not, obviously, I'm not a commercial beekeeper because I never have more than 20 hives. At least that's my goal. I only want 10. In fact, I actually have too many right now again, which just seems to happen every year. But what I want to be able to do is focus on how the bees organize themselves in the hive. And because I test and evaluate beekeeping equipment, I need several hives so that I can at least get kind of a, a cursory idea of what's working and what isn't, and specifically in the environment where I live, which is in the state of Pennsylvania in the snow belt where it's really cold. So we get a long winter, heavy snow, so it's a great opportunity for me to evaluate the hardiness and wintering capabilities of bees in the different hive configurations that we provide them with. So the honey is not the motivation. The constant learning about bees is the motivation, and hopefully learning something new every week. And believe it or not, getting questions from viewers has really pushed me into a lot of areas that often I would not have given serious thought to. But because I have to come up with an answer for you, I often might have to do some research or touch base with people that are experts in a specific area just so that I can 
give you the best information possible. So the honey end of it, all the extra honey that I pull off of a hive, and we do both. This is not just a flow hive apiary. We do both traditional extraction, uncapping, spinning, and we also do the regular flow extraction because I've been doing this since 2007 and they didn't have the flow hive back then. The flow hive came out and we started using it in 2016, so it's about 50-50 right now. Plus hive configurations, the Langstroth, the Lance hive, which is unoccupied right now, observation hives for video, different vertical Langstroth base configurations like the flow hive. So there's a lot of stuff that we do here. So for me, it's understanding the bees and what uh, makes them get through. That's kind of the gauge of everything when it comes to beekeeping for me is the health and overall vigor of the bees. Not so much the amount of honey that they're gonna produce, which is why I don't have to push the bees nutrition. I don't have to push the extra sugars on them once they've started. Even the nucleus colonies that I started this year as resource colonies, none of them are fed. But if I needed them to be super productive instead of just organizing themselves so that I can observe how they do what they do, then I would be pushing them with nutrients to make sure they built up fast enough so that we could use them when this late summer nectar flow kicks in and then we could get gallons and gallons of honey off of them. I don't want to process gallons and gallons of honey. I don't want it. I absolutely. So it's, it's to study the bees. That's what I'm doing. So the next one is from L. Will. This is question number nine. Hi, Fred. I've seen other beekeepers talk about how important it is to give a lot of ventilation to a hive to keep the bees from bearding. Otherwise, high internal temps can be detrimental to the brood. What are your thoughts? Okay. Well, if you, what I do for the configuration for venting of the hive is I have a single vent, single entrance. The vent is the entrance. The entrance is the vent. There are no more upper entrances, and I've done all that in the past. I've had upper entrances, I've had the inner cover entrance, vent, I've had uh, venting with nickels and pennies just under the um, inner cover and things like that through the years. So there's some things that people need to consider because here's the problem. We're looking at bees as if they were people, and they're not. Bees have been stress tested by academics. They have been taken to areas where it is extremely hot and the temperatures get to astronomical highs, specifically on lava flows in Hawaii. So as long as bees have water available and the ability to bring that water into their hive and out and they have a vented entrance, a single entrance by the way, then they can control the climate inside the hive. Insulation is key. Where is the most important insulation on your hive going to be? The cover, the top box, and most recently, Be Smart Designs. If you want to write that down, Be Smart Designs produced an inner cover that is insulated now. So that's coming out probably this month, if not next month. But look for Be Smart Designs. They call everything ultimate hive cover, ultimate inner cover, ultimate hive stand, ultimate feeder, three season feeder, and everything else. Look them up for their insulated inner cover. Those insulated covers, whether it's a B-Max insulated cover, that is the single most important thing you can do for your bees. The sun's heat pounds down on your hive in the middle of summer. If you've got a wooden hive with a metal clad top and then just a wooden inner cover, that top gets super hot. The interior surface of that gets hot your bees can even keep up with that provided they have enough water and the population of that colony is big enough so here's the thing when the bees beard on the outside this is part of the question what's going on well we have a surplus of workers in the hive bees inside the hive are respirating they're contributing moisture so what else is going on they're also dehydrating their honey so these bees are getting their bodies out of the way, out onto the front of the hive. And by the way, this is where extended covers come into play. And also if you would look into the hive visors. So any visor that hooks on the front of your hive that provides a shade awning and the bees you'll find will cluster up underneath of that. So they're in the shade, 15 degree drop on average in temperature for the bees that are out underneath that shaded awning. So that gets them out of the hive, out of the way of the ventilators that are working in the hive, 
and they're no longer contributing their own body heat to it and they go into a very quiet state when they're clustered out there and they're just staying cool and out of the way so the interior bees can do their work. So the other thing that you need to worry about is some people are in very arid climates. And when you do an inspection of your hive in these very hot, dry areas, I'm talking about the four border states, for example, you're going to find out that if you vent the upper portions of that, which seems smart to us because we want to vent that hot air out, what else are you getting rid of when you're venting out the top of the hive? You're bleeding off the humidity that is extremely valuable to the bees because they need the humidity to keep their brood from drying out, especially open brood. So when you see the open brood and they're sitting in their little pools of you know, bee bread and the royal jelly that they all start out with, you see this milky substance that they're just bathed in. And if you get a really hot climate with really dry air, it is very difficult for the bees to maintain that moisture. So they're constantly bringing water and liquids in to keep the air moist, to keep the humidity high. And then what's the beekeeper doing? Bleeding it off through a top vent because they're trying to cool the hive and all that moisture is evaporating. So now those bees are still having to bring, they're fighting the tide. And this is not a configuration that the bees would choose on their own in the wild. Feral colonies, when they occupy a tree or some other cavity, do not want one that's got an upper entrance. They want one that's got a lower entrance and that's so they can control the heat the humidity and the complete microclimate in there and you can help them with an insulated cover and now an insulated inner cover and an insulated outer cover. So, so the temps it can be detrimental because sometimes people are thinking, wow, it's 85 degrees out there, it's 90 degrees. What is the optimum brood temperature for the bees? What temperature do they keep the brood at? 94 to 97, somewhere in there. 95 is probably the, the magic number. But if it's 87 outside, that's hot to you and me. They're still heating the brood in there. Food for thought. So I do not recommend venting. Now, if you're in an area that's got 120 degrees or something like that, I'm a fan of providing more shade, a fan of providing more insulation in those areas, and a white cover that doesn't absorb radiant heat. Um, but not venting it off in an area where they're trying so hard to maintain that moisture. So question number 10, JF. Here we go. I've realized that the bees in my apiary, along with many other types of bees, are foraging quite heavily on honeydew from a couple of very big beech trees on the edge of my apiary. We did not have an actual dearth where I live in the UK, but we do have periods between one source of forage coming into an end and another one gaining momentum. And this is when the honeybees seem to go for the honeydew. From a few articles that I've read, it appears that honeydew should be very high in beneficial antioxidants, more so than Kanuka and Manuka honey. I am therefore very interested in learning your take on honeydew its value for the bees, and whether beekeepers should be looking at planting trees that promote insects that produce the honeydew, as you can get a very big source of forage from a very limited footprint by simply planting the right trees. Thanks in advance, Jacob. Okay, so here's the thing. Honeydew. Do you know what that is? If you don't, Honeydew sounds like something that's super tasty, like you'd want to drink it, like maybe Mountain Dew, the soft drink that people like to drink. Honeydew is coming as a waste product from other insects that are feeding on trees. So I don't know if you've ever seen ants, for example, when they're protecting aphids and the, little, the ants provide protection and the ladybugs want to get in there and eat the aphids, but the ants fight off the aphids because we've got the symbiotic relationship going on there. If the ants protect the aphids, the aphids feed on the sap from the plants that they're on and out of their little hind gut comes a little bubble that looks like a clear droplet of water and the bees run up and they lick that little bubble off the hind end of the aphid. So that is honeydew. So it's being metabolized, but see the little insects that are trying to get the sap, and these are from often 
sources where honeybees would get nothing from them. And I'm going to give you an example of that in a second. But when we have insects that bore into the layer, the outer layer of some of these plants and these trees that are being described here, and they're, they're trying to concentrate the sugars in their digestive system. And so what they're doing is they're excreting the extra liquid that still has some sucrose in it. And, but it's, they're making room for what's valuable to the insect. And then honeybees are like the ants in this case. Honeybees discover because they're the biggest brained insects, bees are. And they discover that they can get honeydew by licking the butts of these little insects. And then it actually ends up being a honey crop, a nectar source, where there otherwise would not be a nectar source. So on the face of it, maybe that sounds good, but I'm going to tell you something else about this. So here's the other thing. Should you be planting trees, for example, that attract the insects in the hope that the honeydew that they're excreting out of their digestive system and gets consumed by the bees might actually be better nutritionally than nectar from the flowers of trees. So would that be the trade-off? First of all, it's a sugar. Why are we eating honey? It's a sugar. So uh, we're not really after it for nutritional value, but here's the other thing that I wanted to point out. We have a problem here in the United States with something called the spotted lantern fly. The spotted lantern fly is in the state of Pennsylvania. It's at the complete other end of my state. So they're having troubles finding out where the spotted lantern fly is so that they can control it and kill it. And uh, sometimes, you know, you just walking around trying to spot lantern flies is not easy. So guess what? How do you think they're finding out when an area has the spotted lantern flies present? They're looking at the beekeepers in that area. Because one of the things they feed on, for example, would be grapevines. So grape fields are not foraged for honeybees, but if there are spotted lantern flies present, and they also feed on other fruit trees, but if the spotted lantern flies are there, and we've got local beekeepers that are harvesting honey from an area, they actually were getting a boost from the presence of the spotted lantern fly because of the honeydew that they're producing. This honeydew gets converted into honey by the bees, the honey gets sampled, and then we know, based on the apiary honey sampling, that some of these apiaries actually had honeydew as a component to the honey that they were harvesting. So now they know that within two to three miles of this apiary, there must be spotted lantern flies, and now they can start hunting and looking for those. And of course, the more participant apiaries that provide those honey samples so they could prove that they had derived some of that what would be nectar now is honeydew from animals, the spotted lantern flies, then um, they know that they're in the area. So I don't have anything to lend as far as the nutritional value being better from honeydew from insects because there's lots of variables there. So if you've got science on that and somebody wants to put a link down in the comment section below, by the way, anytime you submit a link, it gets automatically held so then if I look at it and it's a viable link and it's a real science source, not a, you know, an opinion piece or some kind of anecdotal evidence, then I don't release those. But if it is a scientific study that you're sharing that is the link, then that will show up down in uh, the comment section below this video. And you can all read about the potential benefits of honeydew derived honey for the bees. Interesting question. Question number 11. Jack from Mana, Manahawken, New Jersey. What's the most efficient way to remove capping to have as little honey waste as possible when harvesting? I'm using a cold knife, but it seems to cut more than necessary because the cappings are thicker in some parts of the comb. I also don't want a thousand little crumbs when I was using a fork and a scraper, though. Okay. Well, what did I mention earlier? Some of the things that I do is I evaluate beekeeping equipment. So I'm going to talk to you about what was in the cover, the thumbnail of this video today. So the cappings, first of all, if you don't know, when uh, the bees are finished making, storing their honey and they get it right to the proper moisture percentage level and they cap it with a 
wax capping, then it's ready to harvest. And uh, when we harvest it, we have to uncap. We have to perforate that wax capping and get it into a centrifugal extractor. So here's one of the first things I'm going to show you. This roller, it seems cool in the onset. It rolls across the comb, popping little holes and all the little wax caps as it goes. So you would get this thing here and you would just run it across and poke all the holes. And then you, by the way, you don't go like this. Because when you roll it back and forth, it messes everything up and this thing gets all gummed up. And as you can see, it even has little bits of propolis in it. But you roll it across once, roll it across twice, you have all the holes in it. And then you put that in your centrifugal extractor and no cappings are taking off of that. So if you're looking at the method that takes no wax off, this is one. There's another one that I don't like, but I'm going to tell you about it. But this gets gummed up really fast. I don't know that it's awesome, but uh, it doesn't take any wax off of it. The other thing is you'll see some people taking like a hair dryer, but it will be the really hot versions of that. So a heat gun, and then they'll they'll run it across and they'll melt the cappings and you'll see the wax capping melt away and reveal the cell of honey below. I don't do those. And here's why. Heat guns get super hot. They're both in the max. They're melting the wax capping and exposing it. So again, it's not taking anything off. But people have a tendency to get in a hurry to overheat with the gun and you can actually overheat the honey. Overheated honey can actually be destroyed. So I don't like it at all. So I don't use it, the hot gun method, the heat to melt it. So I, I skipped that, but that is a method that people use. And uh, the risk is that you overheat the wax and that you overheat the honey and you damage it and then it's not good. And, and you'll even smell the honey kind of given an off gas as it gets too hot and burns a little bit. So I don't recommend that. Here is, one of the things that uh, he said he did not like here, Jack doesn't like these forks, but you can use a fork to rake across this way to scratch the caps without pulling them off. And you can just poke holes in it, similar to this. It's time consuming. So I usually run it across the tops and just lift as I go and then scrape this off into a collection bin for the wax cappings because some people want to use the wax they want to collect it and by the way this is like the cheapest uncapping device that you can get but along this line there is this uncapping fork and i actually really like this one and why is that because if you look at the angle of it when this goes across the caps it's open-ended here so the caps just shave right across the top and you're leveling out the surface of your comb at the same time. But this definitely is taking a lot of wax off of it. But when you've got comb that goes too far out or that's irregular and wavy and you want to cut down and like reshape that, this is a very inexpensive way to do it. It's stainless steel. It's wicked sharp. And sometimes you'll see them with tines going out forward too. I found that not to be necessary because I like to draw it through. And I think the reason that they have the ones that have the forks that go forward is so that you can run it straight up to the edge. For example, if the, the honeycomb on the frame falls below the edge of the frame. So if it doesn't stick out proud of the surface of the frame, and you want to scrape it away so you can only get this deep. So if you had forks going the other way, you can come in and go right to the edge and lift up and scrape off right to the very edge. But this is one that I like. This is my favorite uncapper right now. So the other thing mentioned is the knife. Here's a cold knife, and that's what he's talking about in the question. Cold knife. It's got a serrated edge on one side here. It's very sharp. Here's a straight edge on this one, also very sharp, but not serrated, and therefore it won't like cut your fingers really easy. But here's my concern about this kind of a knife too. As you know, you see people always, they kind of see saw and come up the surface of it. It's curved at the end, so you can get right in there just under the surface. 
But you know what happens a lot of times with these? You end up scraping some of the plastic. The other thing is uh, people cut themselves with these a lot. So I would say that of all the tools, this knife is the one that causes the most potential injury. But it does work and you can have several of them. And I know that one of them comes with a heated reservoir built into it. It's got a plug on the end of it and uh, will stay hot the whole time you're going. But the same thing, you can overheat it. But uh, I don't see that as necessary, but you can keep these in hot buckets and just keep going with it. Have somebody washing them while you're doing it. Now, the pizza resistance right here. What is that? Well, it's a plane and it's designed for uncapping and evening out those frames of honey and it gets really hot and this is cast aluminum. It has a copper leading edge, so it's self sanitizing overnight. And that edge is adjustable, so you decide how much of an edge you're going to take off with it. The other thing is, this thing will work to get you under, so you can run it right up against the side of this, come right down, and it's continuous. As you're uncapping, the wax comes right through here, flows right out here, and drops off over your hand and makes a mess. But this thing, if you've got really irregular comb and you want to true it up, you plug one of these things in, it's got a switch on it. And uh, I actually like this one. So, but the person that submitted this question won't like it because you're going to take a pile of wax cappings off with that and a lot of honey with it. So the purpose of that is to true up and even up the surface of the honey in the comb. And the other thing is this plane, if you're trying to scrape it all the way down to the surface of the foundation, but not take plastic off, that is a fantastic tool for that. Plus the temperature is already regulated not to be too hot. It comes factory set. There's no adjustments for the temperature. So those are all my uncapping recommendations. Something in there for everybody. And of course, this is backyard. We're not talking about the oscillating blade, the heated system that you just hold one frame after another and just trim it off for mass production. That's for commercial people. We're just backyard people with tiny gadgets that help get us through our uncapping. So thanks for that interesting question. Next, Cactus Carlson. Let's see. What I'm referring to is a deep nectar behind harvest cap. So here's the thing that happened. Do I have a flow frame? Here we go. This is a flow hive problem. So what happened was, Cactus Carlson, when looking at the end of the flow hive, we've got these little buttons here. This is the little trough that when you're harvesting honey, the honey comes out right through here. Activated up above, these frames, these cells shift, they split open, honey runs down, comes out the bottom. What happened was there's a huge heat wave, big surprise this year. Lots of people got enormous amounts of heat. Got up in the honey super, up into the flow hive, the flow hive overheated a little bit. And looking through this end piece right here, they could see that this trough had already nectar down in it. So it would be unripe honey. So it would be super thin, watery nectar still. And it was filling these little troughs. So the question was, how do we go about getting this out of there without causing a big robbing situation with the bees? Because if you pull this out, this stuff is just going to run out like water. It's already in the trough. It's not waiting for you to activate it. So the solution actually was not mine. The solution came from Cactus Carlson because he said what he did was they looked at it because I suggested draping the hive with the insect cloth that you use when you're transporting hives and then uh, pull them out and put the drain tubes in there and then um, go ahead and drain it into a bucket. But what they actually did was they tipped the whole hive this way all the liquid in the troughs went to this end and then they put the tubes in and then they got their buckets ready and then they tipped the hive back this way and it all ran out and down into the bucket and then they just replaced the buttons again that sealed it back up. Now that was actually a really good solution and he also commented later that 
Yeah, it wasn't as much in there as they thought there would be, so it wasn't really like a huge deal. The other thing is, what if you just left that alone? Um, would the bees ultimately get to it? Well, if it's not already leaking through this little weep hole down here, there is this opening right here that the bees are supposed to be able to drink through. But if that was actually sealed up, and while the button's in place, if they were not able to drink through that and that liquid was there, then chances are it would not have gone out on its own, so this would not have corrected itself. And what you would end up with is fermented honey, fermented nectar in there because the water content is so high. So that was a good move. Tilting it back, running it this way, putting the tubes in, tilting back this way, and collecting the surplus nectar that was collected down in there. So that was a good question and then subsequent resolution that we thought we'd share because somebody else might be dealing with it. I've never had anything like that here in my apiary, so that was very good to have that brought up for everyone else. Next question, Mike from Dandridge, Tennessee. Frames that are being used are all the same configuration. It says they're capped, uncapped honey or syrup on the top one quarter and rounding down the sides and capped, uncapped brood, larvae, eggs. So this question is, what Mike is describing is what's on the frames inside the brood frame, brood box, and question whether or not to put a medium super above that, even though the bees are not utilizing all of the frames in the box already. So this is a question that's gonna come up a lot, especially this time of year. Some of you are going into a dearth right now. The spring nectar flow has happened. Some people only get a spring nectar flow. Where I live, we get you know, a rise and fall of nectar resources, but we don't actually get a complete dearth. We just took honey off three days ago. So they're having a surplus of honey this year. So it's really strange. Anyway, so then the question is, when should you expand and put another box on if they have not yet filled those frames in the brood box? So I would suggest, um, because only four out of uh, the 10 frames are filled and those four are at 90% capacity, but we still get extra frames. So would you wait before putting the upper box up? Because as soon as you put the upper box up, where are the bees gonna go and where are they gonna be working? They're gonna move up into that upper box and they may not come back and backfill those first, the frames in the first box. So I try to hold off. And this is because I'm able to check the apiary frequently. If this is a satellite apiary somewhere and you're only able to check it every couple of weeks or something like that, then putting on extra boxes ahead of this upcoming flow would be smart. But if it's an apiary that you can check and do weekly spot checks on and see if they're filling everything out and see what the population of the colony is and how things are going, I still would leave them to use the space available in that brood box before adding the extra super. So if you're not going to be around, add it as an insurance policy. We don't want them to become honey bound, for example, which is when the queen runs out of space to lay eggs. He also comments that they're not going crazy with wax production. Wax production is stimulated by one, being queen right, two, having nectar coming in and the resources coming in, and they'll tend to build the new wax cells as they're bringing in the nectar, which is kind of interesting too. But I would personally wait, keep it in that... Uh, single box until those frames are almost full then add that super otherwise they may move up without finishing out the bottom frames so i think that's a good move there question number 14 derek rice i have two new hives one is very strong the other struggling it has a varroa problem on inspection i don't see any capped brood or even eggs i started formic acid treatment and moved a frame of eggs from the strong hive can they develop a queen for the eggs, or should I try to find a laying queen to buy? Bee Weaver appears to be out currently. Thank you for your help. Okay, so there's a couple of questions that I have too. So if you if you say like, for example, it says right here, it has a Varroa problem. So what I'd like to know is, what's the Varroa problem? In other words, I did a count, sugar shake, alcohol wash, Dawn dish detergent, However you did the count, 300 bees is normal to count. And then what the Varroa numbers were. So that's good information to have. And on inspection, I don't see any capped brood or even eggs. So 
no cap brood, no eggs, but what about open larvae? Was there any of that around? And because the other thing is, as bees get into a dearth, sometimes, depending on the line of bees you have, the queen may stop laying for a period this time of year. So just like when they go into winter and the conditions are not right, the resources aren't coming in, the queen may stop laying eggs for a period. So they may also do that in the summertime. Do you know what else sometimes happens in the summertime? When they have a predictable dearth coming in, queens and workers will often produce fat-bodied winter bees in summer because they're preparing for a dearth just as they do in the wintertime. So those are nurse bees that are fortified with extra resources, extra fat in their body, and they can generate the nutrients necessary to sustain the residual larvae during the dearth period. So the same thing they do in the wintertime, they can also do in the summertime during a dearth period. So interesting there too. But can they make a queen, if they want to, from the eggs, if you put them in? Yes, they can. And remember that we are 30 days out. So once you do that, you have a 30-day delay while the eggs get fed. You know, the fourth day it's going to hatch. It's going to end a third, beginning of the fourth day. They're going to hatch. They're going to get fed. The queen is going to take 15 days to hatch out. And then when she does, she needs nine days to mature, make a mating flight. Let's say all that's perfect. So you are 30 days out before you see new adult bees in that colony if you choose that route and everything goes perfectly. Now, if you want to make sure that things are going without a hitch and you're positive you don't have a queen, then go ahead and buy in a laying queen of the stock that you prefer. And I thought that uh, Bee Weaver was back in stock. If they're not... Um, Please somebody put that down in the comment section below. But I think that they said that they do have their stock back in. So you can get emergency queens. But watch the heat. Here's the other thing. Treating with formic. So if you're treating with formic pro, which is formic acid, this stuff has very powerful vapors. And people have had problems with die-offs when they're treating with this material for the varomite. The problem really comes into play when your temperatures are going to be high during the period of treatment. So even Randy Oliver, when he did these tests, he had temps that went way off the chart and went beyond the recommended temperature parameters for the treatment. So please look at treatment temperature requirements for whatever treatment you're using for the Varroa. But when it comes to formic acid, you want to make sure that the temps are not too high because it causes the stuff to be even more volatile, the fumes are stronger, bees evacuate the colony, and you also may have a detrimental effect on some of the bees. You may have. I'm not saying you will. Randy Oliver certainly did. So you want to be very careful about temperature parameters when you're going to treat with that material. And I want to know what the mite counts were. Question number 15, last question of the day. This comes from McCabe, Southern Illinois. We're planning on planting bee-friendly flowers. We considered planting right by our hives, but I'm wondering if that will attract more threats and ultimately lead to more trouble for the bees than if we planted 100 yards away. What's your take since you've planted for bees? I do plant for bees, and I plant all over the place. A lot of people think that they're planting for convenience for the bees, and they want to put the plants all around the apiary. And some people have garden apiaries that are absolutely beautiful and they put all the resources there. But here's what you need to remember when we're planting for bees. To get their attention, because remember, bees are floral constant. So for example, if you planted 20 plants of one type, but that plant is not represented in the landscape anywhere else, you're gonna have a very small representation of bees that are gonna forage that plant. Where, for example, if you had white clover and you had acres and acres of it, the bees are likely to feed on white clover because then uh, there's so much of it that it's worth their time to commit foragers just to that plant. So, but planting right next to the apiary is not necessarily a huge advantage because the bees, if you watch them fly out, although in periods of dearth when times are tough, I'll look at the clover right in the apiary, right in front of the hives, and you'll have bees on all the little clover blossoms. But you'll also have bees on those 100 yards away. But uh, when things are bad, they're all over the stuff right next to them. But the thing is the quantity of what you're going to plant. So 
you want to make sure that you can put out enough of it you know to really attract the bees because it happens often that people will plant a specific plant that they've read about they know it's a nectar resource they know the bees just love it and it makes great honey but they have 25 plants we need thousands of those plants in order for that to be meaningfully represented in the nectar and the pollen for the bees to use to rear their brood so i would give thought to that and people that have limited ground uh, this was hit upon earlier when we were talking about the honeydew trees so trees like basswood trees that can generate a huge nectar flow if you don't have the land for acres of a certain plant variety that the bees can use so well then planting trees is a tight second because the trees are vertical gardens so looking at trees that have the broadest floral time frame and the highest nectar yield because there's an arborist that did a whole discussion about linden trees on YouTube. So if you look at look up linden trees as a nectar source for bees and things like that. He's a beekeeper, but he's an arborist. And he talked about the number of trees that yielded 1,200 pounds of nectar. So I don't know if it was an acre of those trees or how much of it it was. But it's worth looking into if you have limited space, but you want something that provides shade for your colonies if you're in a hot area plus a nectar resource, there is some truth in the potential if you have a lot of that resource around that you're, you're drawing in other nectar feeding insects that could ultimately challenge your bees. Kind of the same as feeding right on the hive. We don't want your apiary to be the source for all of this nectar that draws in bees and, and other pollinators from around the area to your apiary. Because then again, when those resources are exhausted, they search the immediate vicinity first, what's there, hives, what's in the hives, honey, and more that they can get. And if we're talking about wasps and yellow jackets and things like that, you could potentially have brought in new pressure on those hives. So that's it. So today, what else? Just be ready to expand your supers. We're going to expand the frames on the Long Langstroth hive this week. Still looking for my queen, but there's evidence that she's there because she's laying eggs. So the other thing is you're running out of time for the self-generated splits. So again, plan that 30 days out. So if you're trying to split colonies and things like that, and you want them to have time to build and get ready for winter time, always plan it from a 30-day mark beyond doing your walkaway splits and things like that because we're getting near the end. So for me here, you know, the end of the second week of July, that's it for splits. After that, you know, you're really stressing them, really taking a chance. Uh, also, if you're putting in your frames for your supers and you're going to run them through an extractor, make sure to consider the strength of the foundation in those frames. So it's not a great idea to have foundationless frames up in your honey supers that you're going to be extracting unless you're doing something like making cut comb but the centrifugal force of a centrifugal extraction system is probably going to break those combs. So you have to be very careful about that. Plastic foundations, acorns number one, wired reinforced foundation if you're going to put it in an extractor and you want real beeswax, for example. And uh, mite counts also. Please, because this is a weird year. A lot of people are reporting one or two mites in a mite count. So I would love to see from you, if you're watching the video, and if you do mite counts, and I hope you do, uh, what's the method that you use, where are you located, what are your mite counts like this year? That's it. Do you have a lot of mites, or is this a weird year where the mites are not showing up? And don't forget, there's that app called Bee Scanner, or Bee Scanning. I'll put a link down in the video description. Uh, when you have a brood frame out, use your cell phone, take four photos of the surface of the frame, and this bee scanning app has done a great job of picking out varroa mites for you. So if, for example, you photograph the frames, you wouldn't be doing a, a mite count. You're just doing the photographs, and if that shows that you've exceeded your threshold for requiring treatment for mites, you don't have to do a sugar shake. You don't have to do an alcohol wash because you've already noted that many mites on the surface and it requires treatment and the app for your phone will actually tell you this hive needs to be considered for treatment. Your mite counts are high 
and then you get to see little samples of the pictures that show the actual mite. So you know, is it really a mite? Or is it just where the wing attaches to the thorax or something like that, or the tongue of a bee, that kind of thing? Those are the kinds of mistakes that have been made in the past. Now, on the other hand, if it doesn't show mites in the pictures, would you consider the colony free? No. Then you would have to do your mite count with a sugar shake or your alcohol wash as a follow-up to make sure that they are indeed mite-free. But the Bee Scanner app can save you a lot of time because you take pictures of the frames. If it shows high mites and you agree those are mites, then you already know that's a colony that needs treatment, no other counting necessary. But it can't be used to certify the hive as free of mites. I hope that makes sense. So thanks for watching. If you're wanting to know if you've seen all of these, don't forget to click the like button down below. And I hope that you're going to have a fantastic weekend. And as we close out today, enjoy the video sequences of my backyard this morning. Thanks for watching. Have a great weekend.